In our hypermediatized societies, communication with the public invariably transits through the filter of written, radio, or audiovisual media. But there are many scientists who are far from satisfied with the relationship they have with the journalistic world. È difficile comunicare con i giornalisti. I giornalisti scrivono sempre cose diverse da quelle che uno ha detto. Se io dico il sole è splende nel cielo, loro dicono il sole è coperto. Cioè dicono delle cose diverse sempre, non so perché. Pour faire passer le message, ils veulent être très entiers, catastrophistes parfois. There are usual problems with the media. Uh, if you cannot deliver your message in a few seconds, the message is not taken into consideration. So what is asked to us is to deliver a very shocking message in a very short time. Il y a des simplifications qui sont qui nous gênent beaucoup nous les scientifiques. And there are plenty of examples where scientists views and words have completely been completely turned around but I think that's very rare and I think you know I've worked with media for many years and I can count on one hand the number of times where I know that a journalist has been trying to get a different story from the truth it is apparently a very visceral relationship but which is not representative of the rather positive general appraisal that brings scientific research and the world of media together as for climate change, Hans-Peter Peters is definite. I think it is a rather a success story. If we look at the outcome, I mean the media do cover climate change very extensively. Uh, they uh, um, orient uh, themselves mostly at the dominant position of the, the majority position of the climate change community. Uh, and the media audience uh, follows uh, uh, this media coverage. But if everything is for the best, or almost, in science media relations, how is it that such a degree of doubt and incredulity still reigns over certain fundamental points tied to climate change? Even if the broad majority of the public accepts the principle of global warming, a significant number of people voluntarily reject its human origins. Yet, scientifically speaking, the arguments proposed by this skeptical minority are practically never verifiable. Because if you look at history, you know, we've gone through periods of, of climatic change and it seems it's a natural pattern in the world. If you look back at climate records, things like sediments and ice core records, we know that climate changes over many centuries and millennia and, and so on, and those, there are natural variations in climate. But what we're seeing today is a much more rapid change than is seen in those records. There's volcanoes and there's all sorts of other things happening naturally in the, in the Earth that creates climate change. Although the CO2 levels have been high sometime in the planet's past, those levels have changed over thousands or millions of years, whereas we're doing it over decades and centuries. Well, the thing that I'm not sure about is whether it's a natural process or it's an accelerated natural process by human action or it's an entirely um, because of human action. We've known for 150 years that if you add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, you increase the greenhouse effect and the planet will warm. The thing that man is not really understanding is what we are doing to, that may well be subtly affecting climate change, isn't it, by machinery and industry. Global warming has been happening uh, really since the middle of the 19th century when we started to industrialize and put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Le réchauffement climatique, on le voit au niveau des séries temporelles à partir à la fin des années 1970 et euh, on voit également, on note une forte accélération à la fin des années 1990. Science being largely unanimous, the doubts of the public might simply be psychological people decidedly do not want to be responsible for such a phenomenon. The impact of climate change in oceanography, so it'll be seen in sea level rise, it'll be seen in changes in species distributions, in fishing. And these are all things that tend to be seen as bad news stories. And so the public, when they hear climate change, more and more these days will tend to, if you like, shut it out. All the more so, given that in our Judeo-Christian societies, the sentiment of responsibility is very quickly felt in terms of guilt. It's our fault, it's not your fault, old people's fault. 
It's a wonderful opportunity for certain media, hungry for controversy and stormy debates, to step into the breach. Quite often we see in the media controversy, particularly when we're looking at climate change. The consequences? Doubt is maintained even if there's no scientific basis. It's a bit like saying, OK, we're going to have um, a television programme about the fact that the Earth is round. But we need to balance that. We need someone to come and talk about the fact that the Earth is actually flat. And I can guarantee you'll find someone out there who will call themselves a scientist and they will debate whether the Earth is round or flat. It's not a debate. We know it's round. And I think we've got to be very careful that we don't get drawn into some of those debates because it implies that we don't know. In many things, we do know, and there isn't really a debate. The debate is created by the media rather than created by science. From now on, the scientific community must constantly improve its capacity for communication with the public, the media, and the decision makers. Throughout Europe, remarkable initiatives are flourishing here and there. At the Oceanographic Institute of Warnemünde in Germany, Sven Hiller is organizing familiarization sessions in oceanography for middle school and high school students. Our target group is uh, mainly the uh, older school students, so aged 15 to 18. We had to make a decision when we started our project and we came to the conclusion that it's a good idea to start with a topic which is already uh, present in the media, that was climate change. So, it requires a different approach, it requires different skills. I think that being able to write clearly for non-specialists helps to clarify your own ideas. Amazing. At the National Oceanography really Centre in Southampton, John Copley gives training courses in scientific communication to the oceanography students and coaches them in how to address a public audience or a member of the media. There isn't a big sort of secret to successful communication with wide public audiences. It's not some sort of you know, innate talent that some people are born with and other people aren't. It's something that can be learned and the basics can be learned very rapidly. Once you give people the skills to do this, the students that we train, it's a delight to see them then running with it and being incredibly successful and effective in communicating with wider audiences. Here at the Aquarium of Genoa in Italy, the European Accent Project organizes public debates on climate change, during which people from the audience have the possibility of speaking on equal terms with scientists and decision makers. Non rientrano nell'educazione scientifica in senso stretto, ma sono un'attività tipica della nuova comunicazione della scienza. Ma tutto quello che the goal of the meeting is to establish two-way communication, scientists towards the public, but also the public towards scientists, with a view to giving decision-makers themes that provide food for thought. I go, I zoom. Lastly, in Lecce in southern Italy, Professor Buero of the University of Salento has succeeded in setting up a network of relationships between his team and the public that is incredibly efficient. The best way to become aware that science is important is to perform science, to be involved into science, and to see that even the lay people can be scientists. Since then, more than a dozen years ago, the scientist has observed major changes in populations of jellyfish along the Italian coasts, which is his scientific specialty. This global warming is having this big effect. The species that are present in the summer are present also in the winter, and tropical species that were not present before are now present because the conditions are good for them. And so there is a very strong indication that the Mediterranean is becoming more and more similar to a tropical sea. But his main problem was that he was painfully short of staff. It's not easy to keep under control thousands and thousands of kilometers of coast for the whole year. 
and the only way is to involve people into this enterprise. Ferdinando Boero then had the idea of launching a vast all-out operation called Jelly Watch that directly involves people who frequent the marine environment, ranging from professionals to simple tourists. We started a campaign asking people to send their records to us so to fill a database on the presence of jellyfish. Con la la le pubblicazioni si sta parlando molto delle meduse c'è la campagna dell'Università del Salento che è stata molto interessante e molto apprezzata da noi. This has become a very successful enterprise because we received thousands and thousands of records and people became they became almost fanatics of jellyfish. They were looking for them, they were taking pictures, they were sending information from the whole Mediterranean. To involve people into a scientific enterprise is a very important thing to make people perceive about the importance of science. Because science, especially in Europe, is carried out with public money. So the public must be informed about the importance of science. This should be a very good example on how to involve people with science and science with the people. So the two things should go together in a democratic country. It is thus by remaining vigilant and by taking new paths in terms of communications that scientists will have the greatest chance of reaching the public's conscience and, by association, that of the decision-makers. <laughs>